We'll give everyone about another minute. Rishi, you can hear me, can't you? Yeah. Yep, you're all good. Okay, thanks. All right, good morning, everybody. It's nine o'clock. Well, it's nine o'clock here. It may be tomorrow where some of you are. I hear this is a uh, multinational meeting. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Happy May Day. Um, what we're going to do this morning uh, in the next 30, 40 minutes is talk about uh, malignant penile neoplasms, mainly squamous cell carcinoma of the penis, because that's most of what uh, you need to know when it's most common and what you're tested on. Uh, as you can see here, although I work at the University of Washington, my athletic allegiance is not here. It's in Ann Arbor. Go blue. And I have nothing to disclose. And Dr. Sikar Rishi will be fielding the questions from you and we'll go over them at the end. Uh, so feel free to chime in with anything that you may want, an want answered. So there's a lot of uh, international terms for penile cancer that I've learned over the course of my career. Of course, we were always taught it's called penile cancer, but there are certain things that uh, patients or their partners have told me over the years that I found quite entertaining and uh, therefore applied to this lecture. Uh, none are meant to be offensive. These are all true statements. Uh, I can read them all to you, but I think you can read and I'll give you a minute. The most fun one I had was when I get a woody, there's something nasty under the hoodie. Uh, I got a kick out of that one. Um, but you can see that uh, it's a mm, multicultural. Uh, one was sort of an Eastern European. Um, the second to last one was an, an English patient. Uh, and finally, uh, we are frequently referred to as pecker checkers as urologists. And so I thought that one was fitting as well. So let's move on. So the most common type of penile cancer, which is the focus of today's lecture, is squamous cell carcinoma. And there's a, a number of other histologic variants, most of which you'll probably never see, uh, unlikely to ever be tested on. Uh, the one that can come up is called a verrucous carcinoma. Uh, the most important aspect of these is they can look similar to fungating nasty squamous cell carcinomas, but they never metastasize, so you don't have to worry about any of the things we're going to talk about, about inguinal lymph nodes or pelvic lymph nodes or things like that. Uh, in my career, I have seen a Kaposi sarcoma in an HIV positive man, but that was back in the 1980s when we didn't have treatment for, a, uh, for AIDS. Uh, but so primary sarcomas tend to be in immunocompromised patients and also, again, pretty rare. That's the only one I've seen in my 35 years. So risk factors, uh, certainly something very important. I think over the years, uh, when I was at your level, it was basically being uncircumcised. Uh, that was essentially all we knew as a risk factor, but there's been enough studies in the last couple of decades to show that it's, it's not just being uncircumcised, it's being uncircumcised with poor genital hygiene. Um, there was a good study from Brazil, a long time ago that showed that uncircumcised men with good hygiene had no higher incidence of squamous cell carcinoma of the penis than um, circumcised men. And it was basically a hygiene issue. Now there's certainly some um, chronic inflammatory conditions like uh, phimosis or chronic balanitis, uh, genital lichen sclerosis, which is called BXO, which cause chronic inflammation, which are associated with uh, penile cancer. Um, and certainly HPV is clearly associated and uh, you always question about what subsets of HPV. I always just remember it based on um, when I was allowed to drive, which was 16, and when I could vote, which was 18. And that's really all you have to remember. Smoking has been associated. Poor hygiene, as I alluded to earlier, uh, of course, relates to being uncircumcised. Um, pathology. There's a new terminology here called penile intraepithelial neoplasia, um, P-E-I-N. It's a little confusing, but it, it's usually, a, it, it's, it's replaced carcinoma in situ of the penis. So it's the more appropriate terminology to use. So usually a raised reddened area on the penis, 
And when it's reported pathologically, sometimes you'll get a, you should get a differentiated versus undifferentiated. And I think the thing to keep in mind is that a differentiated PEIN uh, is usually a chronic inflammatory condition, whereas an undifferentiated PEIN is almost invariably due to HPV infection. Now, the other terms that have been used and are still used to this day is if you have a lesion like this on the penile shaft or in the foreskin, that's called Bowen's disease. Uh, whereas if it's on the glands penis, that's called erythroplasia of Quera. Those are words that are usually used on tests. Um, another important pathologic variable is the fact that if it is a squamous cell carcinoma, they are graded. Uh, and you'll see where that plays into uh, quite importantly about treatment. Uh, and there are three levels of grading, low, medium, high. You might see one, two, three. Uh, the lows and mediums are treated uh, similarly. The high grades are separate. And again, we'll go into that uh, in more detail. Staging. Um, TIS, again, the old carcinoma in situ is now called PEIN. Again, that's a disease purely of the epithelial layer. Uh, TA is a lesion, again, purely of the epithelial laser layer, but it's not penile intraepithelial neoplasia. The T1 lesions, and this is where, not confusing, but it gets very important to subset. So on the glands penis, you have a lamina appropriate layer, and the tumor can grow into that. Uh, below the lamina appropriate on the glands is nothing but spongiosal tissue. On the foreskin, if it invades the dermis, the lamina propria or the dartos fascia of the foreskin, that's a T1. On the shaft, it can, it can invade the connective tissue uh, between the uh, epidermis and the corporal bodies, regardless of the location. And there's a very, very important separation here, T1A versus T1B. And T1A is, by definition, it's not high grade. There's no lymphovascular invasion and there's no perineural invasion. Whereas T1B is any one of those three. So if it's high grade, or if there's presence of lymphovascular invasion or, or perineural invasion, it's considered a T1B lesion. And again, they're treated differently. So that's a very important distinction. Now, T2 lesions, uh, are ones that invade the corpus spongiosum. Now on the, on the glands, that's basically everything right below the lamina propria. On the ventral shaft, it can be in the spongiosal layer with or without invading into the urethra. Uh, I have a picture in a second I'll show you to help explain this. Um, T3 lesions are tumors on the shaft of the penis that invade into the corpus cavernosal, which includes the tunic albuginea, again, with or without urethral invasion. Lesions on the gland, these used to be called T2 lesions, and I'll show you that in the picture. Um, T4 lesions are ones that invade adjacent structures. And um, if you look at predictors of metastasis for squamous cell carcinoma, because again, these all relate to management, we talked about high grade versus low grade. Stage, T stages is another one. And the other thing that you want pathologically, again, perineural invasion or lymphovascular invasion, as I alluded to, because that differentiates T1 from T, T1A from T1B. So they're all important uh, parameters that should be reported. Now, this is a picture from a long time ago, but I think it really helps uh, understand this. And I think the imp important parameters here, and I'll try to use my thing, is to look at, if you look at the uh, ventral surface, you can see that anything growing into the corporal spongiosum uh, is a T2 lesion. The lesion on the, in the corporal cavernosum that has a T2 next to it, a sort of lower left-hand portion of the picture, is now a T3, but that used to be a T2. So that was a lesion growing into the corporal cavernosum. And I, I alluded to that on the uh, nomenclature of the slide. And I think most importantly is to look at the glands. And you can see that anything growing below the epithelial layer of the glands is a T2 lesion. Because essentially you're growing into the spongiosal tissue. You're just doing it right through the uh, mucosal layer of the of the glands. So that gives you a good pictorial of sort of the various stages. Now with nodal staging, um, fairly straightforward. N1 is basically 
a palpable single lymph node. I think you could call this on imaging as well, but normally if you see it on imaging, you should be able to feel it. Uh, N2 is when you have uh, two or more unilateral or nodes or bilateral nodes, and they, we've separated N2 into non-bulky and bulky. So non-bulky is less than four centimeters of total palpable or imaging-based disease, and bulky disease would be more than or equal to four centimeters of disease. And then you'll also see people who may have fixed inguinal node disease unilaterally or bilaterally, um, or they have disease in their pelvis based on imaging. This is considered N3, and we'll talk more about that in the future as well. <coughs> now, uh, when you're seeing a patient, there's a couple things about exam and initial diagnosis that are very important. The key to your exam is to sort of establish the nature of the primary lesion. Do you think it's invasive? You know, is it fixed to the tissues? Is it mobile on the skin? Uh, palpation of the inguinal lymph nodes, I'm sure you've all learned this, but you sort of have men in the frog leg position with their knees falling out just relaxed, and that shows you the anatomical landmarks of the inguinal triangle, which we'll go over in a couple minutes. And you can usually get a pretty good palpatory sensation of what's going on in the inguinal regions, with the exception of really very obese men. Um, but your landmarks are easy to feel, so you should examine their inguinal, their inguinal nodes. Now, the issue of biopsy is an interesting one. I think a lot of these lesions that you see that are just clearly cancers, they don't necessarily require a separate biopsy. Although, whether you do a punch biopsy, an incisional biopsy, an excisional biopsy, partially, those are all fine if you need to do that in, in terms of proceeding with your treatment. Uh, as I said, for some really, I, uh, better now, Rishi? Uh, I think for, um, give Rishi a thumbs up if I'm frozen or not frozen. Am I frozen? Uh-oh, Rishi's gone, well, we're good. All right, um, so penile biopsy. Uh, as I said, any of those types is fine. I think if the patient's very leery or worried, then doing a biopsy to prove, it's not gonna give you an adequate stage, but it'll give you a histologic diagnosis, possibly a grade. That's totally fine. Uh, but don't feel bad if it's an obvious malignancy that you would just proceed to treatment of the primary without a separate procedure for a biopsy. But as I said, any of those are fine. Sometimes, you know, the lesion, you're just gonna make it bleed, it's gonna hurt, you do it in the office, you know, but again, if that's what's required for the patient to be satisfied with the situation in terms of what you're telling them to do, that's totally okay. So let's talk about treatment of the primary lesion. So for, penile intraepithelial neoplasia or TA lesions or lesions that you think are TA, um, wide local excision is perfectly fine. Certainly for PEIN, uh, circumcision alone, if it's on the foreskin, any of the laser treatments, if it's on the shaft um, or for sure on the glands are okay. Carbon dioxide, neodymium YAG, KTP are all fine. Um, as long as they can be anatomically effective. So you have to make sure that you can give a, an appropriate treatment. Now as to topical therapies, these are usually reserved for just intraepithelial neoplasia. The preferred one is a 5-FU cream, um, which again blocks DNA synthesis by inhibiting thimidylate synthesase. Uh, I don't think you'll ever be asked that, but nonetheless, you apply it twice a day and it can take two to six weeks. Uh, for the lesion to go away, uh, whereas the uh, amiquimod you put on three times a week and that can take a little bit longer. So if you're ever asked, the 5-FU cream is, is better to use than the amiquimod cream. And again, that's really for intraepithelial neoplasia and a small TA lesion. Now, once you think something is aside from the epithelial layer alone, if it's a biopsy in a T1 and it's a low grade, you know, basically penile preserving surgery is the primary recommendation, whether that's local excision, 
uh, wide local excision with or without skin grafting. If you can reapproximate the skin, great. Uh, circumcision, for instance, is an example of not needing skin grafting. You could use a laser if you're comfortable that you can remove all the possible tissue. For high grade T1 lesions, again, wide local excision with or without skin grafting is fine. But at the same time, uh, if you needed to do a partial panectomy or a total panectomy based on the location and the size, those are all totally acceptable. Uh, it's a judgment call based, again, on size and location. Now, once you start getting into a lesion that's clearly invasive, um, really your two options are partial or total panectomy. You shouldn't do any conservative measures on these. Um, it's important when you do a partial panectomy, I think there's a couple points. Number one is, you have to make sure that you can get a clean margin. Um, number two is the length of the stump is very important. Um, two reasons. One is that most of these men will stand to urinate and they have to be able to hold the stump so they can direct their stream. But some men, particularly in the obese ones, if they sit to pee and you don't leave them enough stump, they'll actually <laughs> pee over the toilet seat. Uh, which is quite problematic. Uh, so you have to be aware of that. If you really have someone where you're not sure you can leave them an accurate stump to direct their stream, then you do a total panectomy with a perineal urethrostomy. Uh, intraoperative frozen section, very important. You have to prove you have a negative proximal margin. Also, uh, if you're going to do partial or total panectomy, it's always a good idea to have some degree of counseling preoperatively about the loss of their penis, uh, which will help hopefully with their uh, acceptance of this or understanding. It's pretty rare to do lymph node dissection at the time of panectomy. It's not necessary. It doesn't change prognosis. Uh, in general, you're waiting for a pathology report from the panectomy as to staging to then decide on whether you need to do node dissection in non-palpable disease, which we'll go over. And if someone has palpable node disease, uh, it's best to wait and do it as a separate setting. Uh, and you'll understand why as we go through this. In the old days, uh, we used to wait several weeks afterwards anyway, related to take, giving antibiotics and changes in exam that could occur just from inf inflama inflammatory changes from the primary tumor. So this is, I think, management of the lymph nodes. This is for the residents. So I was one of the ones that sort of goes, oh no, what do I do? Uh, sometimes they say, oh shit, but not usually in public. Um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to make this easy for you. And it isn't really that complicated. The reason that you find it difficult is it's not a common disease. So when it does show up, you're like, oh, I can't remember. So there's a couple basic concepts that I think will help you to understand the management. One of them is that if you have palpable nodal disease and you were to remove them, the prognosis is much worse <clears throat> than if you only had microscopically positive lymph nodes. So the point there is there's a difference, and you'll, we'll get into this, about how you manage the lymph nodes in the face of a certain primary. If they have palpable disease, their survival is much, much worse than if they have non-palpable disease but microscopically positive. So again, we'll come back to that. When do you do pelvic lymph nodes? Well, again, we'll cover it, but mainly the only time you do pelvic nodes is when you have bulky inguinal disease. Then you would do check the lymph, pelvic lymph nodes as well. Now I've heard that uh, there may be people from all over the uh, world listening to this lecture. So I thought I'd have some um, language uh, variation to help with some of them. So another key concept to remember is that once you have disease in your pelvic lymph nodes, I mean, in here in America, we say you're toast because that's really true. In France, you'd say la fin, which means the end. Because um, in general, the prognosis is abysmal. There's a lot of studies that have a five-year survival of zero if you have pelvic lymph nodes. And another key component is if you're examining someone and their inguinal lymph nodes are fixed, in general, you don't operate on those. Uh, we used to. Uh, we called that heroic surgery. Uh, and that's really all it was. It was pretty terrible. So if, you, if you're examining someone and they have bulky disease or you don't think you could remove it, then don't. It's that simple. 
So you don't operate on, on fixed disease. Well, again, we'll come back to that. So those are the basic concepts which will help us understanding some of the things we're about to cover. So let's go over the femoral triangle or the inguinal lymph node dissection template. And I thought this was a good picture because it shows you the structures that you're feeling. Now you have to remember that overlying this is this whole thing is the fascia lata. Uh, and then the fossa ovalis is the little is a little window in the fascia lata, right where the saphenous veins coming out of the femoral vein. Uh, but the, the borders are the sartorius muscle laterally, the adductor longus medially, and the inguinal ligament superiorly. And so you can see the triangle. And if you put a man's leg in a frog-like position, you can feel these pretty easily. And this is the nature of your, of your uh, template for your node dissection. Nowadays, most people are preserving the saphenous vein, that which is thought to lower lower extremity edema. I'm not sure if that's true. Uh, that was a Dr. Catalona thing, which was a very good observation many years ago. You do always have those little uh, branch veins that you'll have to tie off during the dissection. Um, in general, a superficial inguinal lymph node dissection includes all the tissue over the fascia lata in this triangle below scarpus fascia, so the, your, your um, flaps are defined by scarpus fascia. A deep inguinal lymph node dissection means you're going deep to the fossa ovalis, basically in, this, in the lymph node tissues next to the femoral vessels. And we'll come back to that as well. And when you make an incision, if you're doing this open, which of course nobody does nowadays, uh, but if you had to or did, uh, there's two types of incisions. I always preferred a transverse sort of uh, incision below the inguinal ligament, about four or five centimeters. Some people do a uh, uh, up and down incision that crosses the inguinal ligament. Uh, the ones transverse below tend to heal pretty well, assuming your flaps are well preserved. So a couple principles of inguinal lymph node dissection. Uh, some of these apply to robotic surgery as well. Um, there's crossover drainage from the penile tissue. Therefore, you tend to do, you, you, you do bilateral surgery. We'll talk about the one instance where you do unilateral. Again, frog leg position in the operating room, mild extension uh, to the pelvis, you know, pad the knees, SCDs. Again, as I said, I prefer a transverse femoral triangle incision. Use scarpus fascia as your flaps. Use uh, soft retractors, not hook blades, and be very gentle with them. And the preservation there, if you have a good scarpus fascia thickness, thickness is excellent. Uh, one of the big issues here has to do with lymph leaks. And I can tell you in my own experience, whether you do silk ties, clips, ligature, whatever you want to do, it's all the same. Uh, you have to try to be meticulous, uh, but you're going to get lymph leaks and long-term drains in almost every day. Uh, remember, once again, the fascia lata is your deep plane and the fossa ovalis as well. Again, if you're doing a superficial node disease, you would only go deep if you had palpable disease in the superficial area. And I think the most important thing about closure uh, is leaving a small JP drain on suction. And basically, you have to leave a drain in until nothing's coming out. If you take a drain out when there's 30 cc's a day, you're going to get a lymphocele. Uh, so it has to be pretty much less than five, if not zero. And historically, we use we put them on bed rest for four or five days. I don't think you have to do that anymore. Uh, we gave antibiotics for a week. And whether you want to use a running suture on the clips on the skin or clips is just your own personal preference. If you have a good flap, it's going to be fine either way. So those are some of the basic principles. Um, now let's talk about management of the various clinical scenarios. So. The first would be, let's say you had a, uh, a lesion on the penis and the inguinal adenop there's no inguinal adenopathy, so they have non-palpable nodes. And remember that there are, there are some of these lesions that are very inflammatory, and so if you have these sort of marginal exam preoperatively and you did treatment of their primary lesion, we used to give everyone antibiotics for a couple weeks, as I said, and then reassess them on exam, and sometimes you'll see dramatic shrinkage, in which case they have a normal exam. Um, if not, I'm, what I mean dramatic shrinkage is I mean resolution. Uh, <laughs> you also get dramatic shrinkage on certain types of penile operations, but that's understood. 
Uh, when it comes to the pathology from your primary lesion, again, if you have a low-grade TA lesion or a inner epithelial neoplasia, a T1A lesion, and non-palpable inguinal nodes after a few weeks, those men are put on surveillance. There's no reason to do their node surgically. Their risk of nodal disease is, is very, 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 very low. If you have pathologically a T1B or a T2 lesion, and again, this is why the pathology from the primary really dictates what you do in conjunction with your exam, then you would image these people. Um, if they have no evidence of metastasis on chest, abdomen, and pelvis imaging, and they have a T1B or a T2 lesion, then really those are the people that are best uh, treated by doing a bilateral modified superficial inguinal lymph node dissection, which is essentially the tissue I showed you in that uh, template, you know, with preservation of the saphenous vein. And again, the only reason you would do pelvic lymph nodes on those people is if surprisingly you found, you know, easily measurable and more than three or more positive nodes at inguinal lymph node dissection, which is pretty uncommon. Microscopic involvement doesn't mandate pelvic node dissection. So TA, CIS, uh, T1A surveillance, T1B or T2 negative metastatic imaging, normal exam would be bilateral modified superficial node dissection. If you end up with palpable inguinal disease, uh, non-bulky, meaning less than four centimeters, you'll image them. If they have no pelvic nodal disease, makes sense and their lesions mobile, then you would do a superficial and deep bilateral inguinal lymph node dissection. And once again, you would only do the pelvics if you really had three or more positive palpable inguinal nodes. Now, if someone has non-bulky but fixed disease, then you'll give them chemotherapy first, and if they have a good response, then you would do their node dissection. And we'll go over chemotherapy in a couple minutes. And uh, for those of you that wanted a little Spanish, uh, I thought if you have fixed inguinal and nodal disease from a prognostic standpoint, and you don't get a response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy, that's called el fin, uh, which means the end. Because again, very poor prognosis. Now let's talk about bulk inguinal disease. So this can be unilateral or bilateral. It by definition, it's more than four centimeters. It can be fixed or mobile. But here you're talking about if there's no pelvic nodes on CT, so bulky inguinal disease only. You can do ultrasound guidance, fine needle aspirate, totally fine, positive, you know, then it's positive, although you sort of, sort of pretty much if it doesn't resolve within a few weeks of your penile surgery, you know what it is. But the key factor here is with bulky disease, if it's mobile, you're going with neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and if it's mobile, then you're going to operate the, on them after the chemotherapy, and that would be basically bilateral pelvic lymph node dissection and bilateral inguinal lymph node dissection, superficial and deep. Again, if it's fixed bulky disease, you only operate on them if they have a really good response to chemotherapy, and that would be the same operation as if they were mobile. Um, and of course, if they don't respond to chemotherapy, in Italian, we say that's uh, la fine. And if I'm killing that pronunciation, I apologize. Now, what about for pelvic node disease? Well, normally this is people who have enlarged pelvic nodes on imaging. And you can do fine needle aspiration of pelvic nodes, but the bottom line is if they're really more than two centimeters, it is what it is. Now, if their pelvic and inguinal lymph nodes appear resectable, then again, neoadjuvant chemotherapy and then bilateral pelvic and, and inguinal lymph node dissection if they have a good response. Um, if, they're not if they're not resectable at, at this point in time, they're really never going to be resectable. Uh, and then you would give them chemotherapy, chemo radiation, I'm sorry. And, um, once again, these people have a really a zero, almost zero five year survival in, 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 in uh, Polish, that's called koniec, or the end. Now, what about penile cancer chemotherapy? Since we've now covered all the various possible clinical scenarios. Well, you have to remember TIP, and this does not refer to the gland's penis, 
but it's paclitaxel, iphosphamide, and cisplatinum. Uh, another type of program can be 5-FU and cisplatinum. The response rate to TIP uh, is around 50%. The complete response rate is at best 10%, uh, and that's for groin-only disease. Durable complete response rate is less than 5%, so it's really not a curative treatment. And as you've alluded to from what I've been telling you, its role is to try to help shrink disease and make it amenable to surgical resection. And when we talk about number of cycles, uh, both neoadjuvant and adjuvant, although we haven't really talked about use of adjuvant, adjuvant would be basically for recurrent disease, is four cycles. And most of the men can get through four cycles of TIP. Now, let's just spend another minute or two on surveillance because that's an important parameter. So you've done your initial treatment. Um, you've decided based on their pathology and histology, uh, you're not doing a uh, inguinal node dissection or you did an inguinal node dissection. We'll still talk about that, but let's just say surveillance. So for non palpable disease, basically you're gonna see them quarterly. Uh, every three months for a couple years and then semi-annually to five years. If you get a local recurrence, let's say you did a laser treatment and they recur, you could do another laser treatment. If you did a wide excision and with or without skin grafting and they recur, you're probably better off with a partial panectomy or a total panectomy because your first treatment didn't work. Um, if you did a partial panectomy and they get a local recurrence, then obviously you're going to do a total panectomy. Uh, if you get a local recurrence after a total panectomy, those are very difficult to manage um, because you've already removed everything. It can be quite an ordeal with flaps and whatever. In general, it's usually in people who have metastatic disease, uh, which also then dictates usually what we call a very poor prognosis, which in Serbia they say is called chai. Uh, which means the end. Uh, and as I said, most of these men have already undergone inf inguinal lymph node dissection because you did a total panectomy. And if they get a local recurrence, really the best answer for that is chemotherapy and radiation. It makes sense. If you ever see one of these, it'll make sense why that's the case. Now, the one scenario that's important, and this is, it's not super common, but it's important. And it, you, you, you might see it and you get tested on all the time is, <laughs> Excuse me. Let's say you had a low risk lesion initially or high risk lesion that refused surgery and you had them on surveillance and we went over the surveillance protocol a minute or two ago. But then they develop inguinal nodal disease based on your physical exam and they've been on surveillance. So if it's been, you know, more than a couple months, say more than six or nine months they've been on surveillance and you have a palpable disease, then you're gonna treat them, and I'm saying it's mobile, it's not bulky, you're gonna treat them actually with ipsilateral inguinal node dissection and only do the pelvic nodes if they have more than three or four inguinal nodes. This is the one scenario where you don't do bilateral inguinal lymph node dissection. And it kind of makes sense, because remember I said at the very beginning that the prognosis is based on, the prognosis is much worse for palpable than non-palpable disease. So if you have a period of surveillance and they then develop an ipsilateral recurrence, you would treat that, as we alluded to earlier, but really if they have microscopic disease on the other side, that doesn't change their prognosis and you can follow their other side and you may end up needing to operate on their other side at some point, but they've sort of defined in that nine months, six months, 12 months that they may only have unilateral disease. So that would be the one scenario where you would say you would do unilateral annual node dissection and it's again reserved for unilateral palpable recurrence after an extended period of surveillance. And you only do their pelvic nodes if they had bulkier disease in the groin than you expected. Now, if you do pelvic nodes, I mean, if you do them open, you'll do bilateral pelvic node disease. If you did it a different way, laparoscopically or whatever, you could do just that same side. You wouldn't have to do the other side. So that's the one scenario that's a little bit unusual and where you would actually do a unilateral operation. So that should cover pretty much all the clinical aspects of uh, penile cancer. So that's the end of my lecture. And what I'd like to do now is take time and answer your questions. So I'm gonna turn it over to Rishi to, to feed me the questions and I'll give you the answers. All right, thank you, Dr. Dalkin. Um, 
Got several questions coming in, especially during the lymph node portion, as you expected. Uh, so a lot of questions came up about the role of a fine needle aspiration or a core biopsy in determining your kind of surgical plan for a lymph node dissection. Okay, so um, I think it's completely, re let's talk about fine needle aspiration. Um, I think totally reasonable to do, and normally these are with ultrasound guidance, and that's totally fine to do that before you embark upon a node dissection. Um, in general, if you've given it several weeks for your primary penile surgery to heal, and you still have palpable disease, it is what it is. But it's totally fine because it is a fairly morbid procedure. I have no concerns. And I think nowadays the, the false negative rate of finding the last part, it's, it's based on the pathologist evaluate, you know, doing the study, um, but it's pretty low. So I think that's fine. If you had, let's say for some reason you imaged them and they saw some questionable lymph node that you can't feel, that's actually a very good role for ultrasound guided fine needle aspirin. Uh, in other words, they saw one and a half centimeter lymph node on imaging, you don't appreciate it, then I think that would be a good move to do an ultrasound guided fine needle aspirin. Core biopsies or any open biopsy, I'm not a big fan of that because if you're gonna operate on their groins, you really don't want it to be previously operated upon tissue. It just makes the healing of the flaps a little better. Uh, I've seen patients present where they have an ingual and excisional biopsy of an ingual and node because no one examined their penis to see they had a lesion and it was metastatic squamous cell carcinoma. Fine, you know, a bit of an oversight, but um, it does make ingual and node dissection harder. So I think if you had to pick something, the ultrasound finding the aspirate is better, whether that's an image-based finding that you don't feel, great indication, or some papal finding that you want to prove they need an operation, totally accept. That, hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, thanks. And then I think in follow-up to that, um, what are your thoughts on the role of sentinel lymph node biopsy or mapping? Yeah, um, still controversial. Um, at the same time, in the modern era of ultrasound guided final aspirate, I have no qualms about that. Uh, I think that historically we've learned that if you take the stage, the grade, and the exam with or without imaging, that's not likely to help you make a decision. Um, if you have nothing on imaging, nothing on exam, and a favorable pathology, it doesn't help you. If you have a T2 or a T1B lesion, and you have all the other, the imaging and the exam negative, you know, you could do it, but the accuracy isn't high enough to make that a, a, make that a black and white decision, in my opinion. But I, I wouldn't shun someone who wanted to try to do single node aspirate. I just don't find it that reliable. Okay. If it's negative, positive, fine. But the likelihood of that would be pretty low in that scenario. And then kind of moving on to a, a different topic is when you're doing a partial penectomy, one question came up is, what are your margins that you're trying to achieve? And then two is after a partial penectomy, what kind of timing um, or how long do you wait until you proceed to a lymph node dissection if indicated? <clears throat> so uh, if you're given a test, you know, and you read in the books, they talk about a two centimeter margin for a partial penectomy. Well, on a partial penectomy, based on the penis, that's actually can be a lot of tissue. So the answer is you want a negative margin. Uh, and one of the things you'll learn as a resident over time is the, is the subjectivity of pathologic processing of a piece of tissue. So in general, if you take a margin from the remnant stump, and that's negative, meaning the part you're leaving behind, that's good enough. If it ends up being three or four millimeters on the permanent section of the part you remove, that's okay. Um, because there's changes in the nature of the tissues between the, where you transect it and where you send it to the pathologist and they process it. So you'll read two centimeters. I think that's sort of a clinical judgment based on the location of the lesion and where you're gonna transect the penis. Uh, it should be certainly at least a centimeter, but when it comes to pathology margin, it may only read out as three or four millimeters and that's okay. But rather than counting on your, your um, excised tissue margin, I would send a margin 
uh, from the stump of the penis because that's more accurate in terms of what you're saying. Uh, it gets rid of the pathologic processing error, if that makes sense. I hope that makes sense. Um, and then timing, uh, I still think the three to four weeks is fine. You gotta let, let the penis heal, let it know it's gonna heal up well. They're urinating, the urethral uh, bud looks good. Um, and it, it will give inflammatory changes from the primary tumor or from the surgery chance to resolve before you go into the node dissection. Okay, and then another question, if we're able to treat someone topically, topical therapy, um, do you typically re-biopsy to show an adequate response or just kind of go off physical exam findings? Yeah, uh, either one is fine. I mean, if you don't have resolution, complete resolution of the lesion or just scarification, then you should re-biopsy. If you did a pretty a simple punch biopsy of an easy to biopsy area, then repeating it is perfectly fine. Um, I think if, if you were asked that question, re-biopsy is totally reasonable. Um, but again, it, it, that's one of those subjective calls based on what it looks like. Uh, and it can take, as you saw from that slide, you're talking sometimes up to four months to treat it. Um, and so it could be five or six months later, but I, I would not argue with a, a very thin, if you think about it, if you did a punch biopsy, it doesn't have to be very thick at all because you're talking about an epithelial lesion. So either one would be fine. I think one topic that's always confusing for us trainees is when to decide to proceed to a pelvic node dissection. So do you base that mostly on the number of nodes you find during the uh, inguinal lymph node dissection or does the depth of the node matter? So superficial versus deep? Yeah, so, um, okay, so let's make the assumption that there's no pelvic disease on imaging. And remember, as I said, you then have palpable disease in the groins or uh, visible disease in the groins on imaging. Most people use number of positive nodes. Um, so if you have more than three or four palpably positive nodes, superficially, then you'll do deep, which is below fossil valus. And by definition, if you're in that category, that would be the group that you would then be considered doing pelvic node dissection. So I guess the easiest way to think about that is if it's bad enough to do the deep nodes, meaning you had more than three positive nodes in the superficial inguinal space, then you're in the group where doing the pelvic lymph nodes is, is preferred. Does that, Rishi, do you think that addresses it? Yeah, I think, I think that makes sense. Okay. Um, and then one clarification, I think this was going back to one of the first images you showed demonstrating staging. Mm -hmm. um, can you explain T2 versus T3 stage, kind of more specific to the glands location? Does urethral involvement confer the T3 in that location? Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I, that's the answer is in a corporal lesion, I'm sorry, in a glands lesion that grows into the urethra, that's considered T3. Now remember that if you, if you looked at all those other slides, that the management of T2 and T3 lesions is pretty much the same. Um, so it's an important T-stage differentiation, but in general, those are people that uh, you're proceeding, once you're T2 or T3, then you're proceeding in the same way. So, but the answer to that question, just based on this picture is yes, that's a T3. And a couple of questions on this. So, you know, say you have a patient, a partial panectomy is indicated, but the patient wants kind of everything done to preserve their penile tissue. Do you ever just do a local uh, excision with some kind of adjuvant therapy on top of that, either topical or radiotherapy or something? Yeah, um, the answer to that, of course, is uh, all of these decisions when it comes to the penis are dependent on patient acceptance. So, so let's say you're recommending partial penectomy and they say, you know, no. Well, obviously, if you have a lesion that's growing into the corporal cavernosa, that's not going to be feasible, okay? Um, and, we, now, and we'll come back to this. And whereas if you have something uh, on the glands, you know, and you're going to take a big chunk out of the glands, hoping, including the, you know, the spongiosal tissue, maybe that'll work. It's not optimal. Uh, 
you know, where skin lesions, let's say a high grade lesion on the skin where you're recommending partial and they want to do something different. In general, those are people that are treated with wide excision and skin grafting. Uh, do you do radiation after that? No, because of the skin graft. Um, if you did a glandular excision, let's say, and it actually healed, would you do adjuvant radiation? I don't think so. I think you'd give them an opportunity just to define whether they progress. You'll have to follow those people like the, and I alluded to this one slide, that if they have a T1B or T2 lesion, you did local excision and they refuse to have no dissection, you follow them with surveillance. Um, you're following their local lesion and your their local site and their inguinal nodes. Um, if people refuse any of that, then there are people that will have radiation of their primary lesion. It's just, just not very effective. Uh, and I think, does that address, there was a couple scenarios there. So did I get them all or did I miss one? Yeah, I mean, I think in general that addresses it. I mean, I know there's a growing body of literature on outcomes um, after patients just having a local excision, uh, but I think a lot of it's still fairly unknown, but obviously patient selection is going to be huge. Yeah, um, and you're, there's nothing wrong with a wide excision with or without skin grafting for a T1A, T1B lesion. I mean, that's okay. It's just, if you think about the anatomy of the penis, if they truly have a T2 lesion, it's hard to do that. I mean, it's just not technically feasible. You could argue, like I said, the only time you could potentially do that if you had a, a very small lesion of the glands. Um, but that's going to take a long time to heal and it might look in interesting, but in, that would be the only scenario. And then could you radiate the base of that when you operate on it? Sure, but then it would take forever to heal. Um, I'm not sure you can skin graft the glands, but I don't think that would change it. Or could you reapproximate it if it's really small? Maybe. Um, but that would be, I don't think you're going to run into that situation very often. If you could do local wide excision with or without skin grafting, that should cover most every lesion that you'll find where they're hesitant to have their penis removed with the exception of the glands. Okay. And then a couple of questions, and I think this practice varies um, quite widely across the, the world, is antibiotics. And you kind of touched on this, but you know, I know historically a lot of times for an enlarged lymph node, we give a trial of antibiotics, see what happens to it. But can you talk about you know, this day and age, is that still indicated and appropriate? And also, is there a role for antibiotics in the post penectomy patient who develops an ingu inguinal lymph node? Do you, would you give it antibiotics a try or do you just treat it as a recurrence? Yeah, so let's, part of that is timing. So in terms of initially, I think there's nothing wrong with giving antibiotics. If you're gonna do a partial penectomy and they have, let's say, palpable node disease, there's nothing wrong with giving antibiotics for three weeks. Uh, whether that resolves, whether it's inflammatory and resolves from the antibiotics or just removing the primary lesion, doesn't matter. So nothing wrong with doing it. Uh, I don't know that the antibiotics makes a difference if you think about it. If it's an inflammatory reaction to the primary lesion, the antibiotics, it'll, they'll go away with or without antibiotics. Um, in terms of, uh, therefore, giving antibiotics after the partial penectomy or treatment of the primary, it's not, there's no right or wrong. It's just preference. Uh, what was the second half of that one? Um, I think that was it. There was a question on, I mean, is there a particular type of antibiotic you would consider? Yeah, most people use their first generation cephalosporin. Um, you know, and I think the other one is the other, you did ask a little part about this is that um, privacy or clinical judgment, if you have marginal nodal disease, that's the time when you would wait a couple of weeks. There's nothing wrong with waiting three or four weeks. If you think about it, you're not changing their prognosis in three or four weeks. If they have truly palpable, if they have truly positive palpable disease, <clears throat> that three or four weeks doesn't change their prognosis. So you're not hurting anything by waiting to see if it gets smaller. Now, if it resolves, you know, and it's, and it's a T1A lesion, you're obviously going to do nothing. Uh, if it resolves as a T1B lesion, again, there's where you get into potentially ultrasound fine needle aspirate or recommendation for inguinal node dissection. So I, it's totally fine to give antibiotics, um, especially if you have one of those weeping, ugly, nasty looking primary tumors. 
And I think this is a good question. Given the morbidity of a lymph node dissection, lots of complications, et cetera, how do you balance doing this and, for example, in, a, in an elderly patient? Say it, it may be indicated, but you're concerned how the patient's going to tolerate it. Um, yeah. How do you think about that? So I think the way to look at that is this way, that remember that, so then what you're really talking about is a, uh, the time where the differentiation occurs is a higher risk primary lesion with no disease in the, in the groins. So there you're saying, okay, if I do your node dissection now, and based on your primary tumor, you have a 50, 60% chance of having disease in your nodes microscopically, and I remove them now, your prognosis is dramatically better than if we watch you, and in those 60% that are gonna show up, they've gone from a 70% five-year survival down to a 30% five-year survival. Yeah. So there, the prognosis is dramatically different, and if you have a high-grade, you know, if you have a T1B, T2 lesion, your risk of microscopic disease in your nodes is well in excess of 60%. So there's where prognostically it makes a big difference and you push. Now, in palpable disease, once again, your prognosis is worse, um, but it's better than not removing them. But if you had a really frail elderly patient that's, you know, it's going to be miserable, then you can't do it. And then you'll use a conservator. You can do radiation therapy to the nodes in that situation. But really what you're saying is that you're pretty much portending them a less than 5 to 10% five-year survival. Okay. Um, well, I think we're kind of at the end of all the submitted questions. If I'll look through them again, and if we miss something, I think there's somewhere where we can post them and post some answers afterwards on the website. Um, but at this point, I think we're close to wrapping up here, Dr. Dalkin, unless you have some final thoughts. Uh, no, I hope that was helpful. I am supposed to show one evaluation slide, which I'll pull up here in a second. Maybe. This is for your evaluation of the lecture. You're only supposed to say good things, but I'm okay either way. All right, so I tried to make it simple. Again, once you start seeing a lot of these, which hopefully you never will, uh, but if you do, it does, it's not as complicated as you think. It's like testis cancer, it just takes repetition. All right, Richie, thank you so much for helping. Yep. Thank you, everyone. Okay, bye-bye.